Father, you restored your people to eternal life by raising Christ, your Son, from death. Make our faith strong and our hope sure. May we never doubt that you will fulfill the promises you have made. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. In those days, some Jews from Antioch and Iconium arrived and won over the crowds. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered around him, he got up and entered the city. On the following day, he left with Barnabas for Derbe. After they had proclaimed the good news to that city and made a considerable number of disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. They strengthened the spirits of the disciples and exhorted them to persevere in faith, saying, It is necessary for us to undergo many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. They appointed presbyters for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting, commended them to the Lord in whom they had put their faith. Then they traveled through Pisidia and reached Pamphylia. After proclaiming the word at Persia, they went down to Attilia. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had now accomplished. And when they arrived, they called the church together and reported what God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Then they spent no little time with the disciples. Your friends make known, O Lord, the glorious splendor of your kingdom. The glorious splendor of your Let all your works give you thanks, O Lord, and let your faithful ones bless you. Let them discourse of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might. Your friends make known, O Lord, the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Making known to men your might, and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is a kingdom for all ages, and your dominion endures through all generations. May my mouth speak the praise of the Lord, and may all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Sancti Evangelii secundum Johannem. Gloria 
Jesus said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. You heard me tell you, I am going away and I will come back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it happens, so that when it happens you may believe. I will no longer speak much with you, for the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me, but the world must know that I love the Father, and that I do just as the Father has commanded me. Verbum Domine As we uh, move on through the Acts of the Apostles here in the Easter season, uh, the word that kind of comes to mind Uh, as Paul and as Peter went throughout the known world, really, going out proclaiming the gospel, the charismatic message, the very essence, the nectar of the gospel as we know it, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that his Father in heaven sent him to die for our sins, to free us from the shackles of sins, the fetters of sin, our own sin, and sin itself throughout the world, and to gain us access to the Father, back to the Father. We follow him back to the Father. We look pointedly in the future coming weeks to the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost Sunday, where we see our sanctifier, he who is the person that will give us the strength, the energy, the power, all of those really meaning the grace to get back to the Father in heaven. Can't do it without him. We can kind of lead pretty decent lives. We can be quote-unquote good people, but we'll never be sanctified without the sanctifier. We'll never be holy without the holy, holy one himself, and that is Jesus Christ and the Spirit. Now, with this in this, I think this genre that we speak of late last night, uh, my brother here, Father Mark, and I came back and returned from Rome, and it's interesting because coming back and returning, you feel, I think, a little bit like St. Paul did in today's Acts of the Apostles, where we read a few times they uh, thought he was dead, okay, but he came up and he rose up and he continued to proclaim the gospel. Sometimes the pilgrimage of proclaiming the gospel, of just being out there and being a witness at the very least, even if you're not per se preaching or proclaiming, uh, does take something out of you, and you can feel a little bit beat up, you know, when you uh, get pushed around in the cattle section there of the plane, and you know everybody kind of pouring through. And I know, especially for me, at, I, I have to believe at six foot five inches tall that these seats were just not made for somebody over six feet tall. It takes like a winch to get me out of there after ten ten hours over the Atlantic Ocean. But there's this sense, again, of struggle, of pain that comes with a pilgrimage. I'm here really to uh, say that we all need to enter into this. Uh, Going there uh, is something that I recommend highly, if not if possible, mandate that everybody make a trip to Rome, the eternal city. It really should be something that we have on our calendar, something that we pray for, that we hope for. Many of us cannot make it. A lot of our viewers, homebound, etc., sick, ailing, infirm, uh, we understand that. But there are a lot who can, in fact, make it, but it never hits their radar screen. It's nothing that they even really seriously enter into and think. All people are blessed by a pilgrimage to Rome. Father Mark and I met many people uh, on this trip who weren't even Catholic, who were there in Providence, just at the fest, as the, and I think we can call them festivities, kind of uh, unrolled and were laid out. They were all blessed by it, and they spoke about that. There was something about being there at St. Peter's Basilica. And dare I say, as a priest, something in particular that you receive as a grace to go there. You know, that uh, we were able to actually offer Mass at St. Peter's is, it gives you the, the shivers up the spine to think about it. We had the opportunity to do that. 
Each day, or virtually each day, we went to St. Peter's Basilica and were able to offer Mass, our own Mass there. Okay, not at the high main altar there, obviously, but at one of the many side altars that are there in this really mammoth, this huge basilica dedicated to God in a very appropriate way. And to see there and to be with priests throughout the country and throughout the globe who came to do the same, to offer Mass. Uh, it gives you this real tangible sense of the unity, of the universality, of the Catholic nature Okay, that is the universal nature of the church. We are, in fact, one body. And it, con it just, in a, in a major way, comes in a very tangible way uh, as you walk throughout the piazza of St. Peter's and into the basilica, into the downstairs area where our beloved Pope John Paul II is laid in rest. Uh, it's just un unbelievable. So please make this effort to make a pilgrimage out there. Young people are going in droves, continue to go, young people, to do that same thing. There is suffering. It's, it's part and parcel of making any pilgrimage. You know, I know, and I'm always blessed by a lot of the pilgrims who come here who tell us of all the things that they've had to go through to get here. You know, you're talking about many people making bus trips from up in the Northeast, from Canada, other places. Buses breaking down, hotel accommodations falling through, all these different things that can and are going to be part of your pilgrimage experience, nonetheless really make up really an essential nature of it. That's suffering to make it through. There's something about that. So uh, again, to uh, be able to do that, to be able to be as priests with your brother priests uh, in the sacristy, the mammoth sacristy of St. Peter's Basilica. As one priest told me, he said, Father, as we went there for the first time, be prepared for the sacristy at St. Peter's Basilica. You've heard of the song, Where Charity and Love Prevail. Well, that doesn't necessarily hold in the sacristy, okay? And it was kind of that way, as everybody uh, blitzed for the few elves and the few chasubles that were there. But it was in a holy kind of way, I should say. A couple of things to look at here. Obviously, we were there for the, uh, and blessed to be there for the election of Pope John Paul, or excuse me, still have to get used to, Pope Benedict the 16th, and what a blessing to be on the piazza about five rows back, about 200 yards away from the balcony where he actually came out and walked out there. And the sense of joy that was out there, we've spoken about it before, but we need to continue to speak about it because it goes into that pilgrimage experience. To be out there with largely, again, hundreds of thousands of younger people. Families were there as well, older people. Blessed to see some older priests who made it and said that I, they had to be there, you know, to be at that Piazza of St. Peter's, to see the naming of the Pope and him coming out and giving that first blessing. What an awesome and powerful experience to be there. And there was an interesting conversation I had in that uh, sacristy of St. Peter's Basilica that uh, I want to recount because I think, and I know for myself to this day, I'm a little bit stunned that Cardinal Ratzinger came out on that balcony. I still have to kind of like knock myself on the head and say, did this really happen? And there's a myriad of reasons we can go over why that might be the case. I think we're very much blessed by it. But there's one priest who I spoke to in the sacr sacristy of St. Peter's Basilica who shed some light on this and really kind of, not that we needed a stamp of approval in any way, obviously the Holy Spirit uh, provided us with this great man as our Pope, but he, he spoke of something that uh, I think sheds some light on the reality of the battle that we continue to be in here on earth. And this is, uh, the, I'll just give you uh, bits and pieces of it, but he mentioned to me, he said, Father, he goes, I had the privilege just the other day, this was a few days after the election of Pope Benedict the 16th as Pope, and he said, we met him in the sacristy, he goes, I have to tell you, uh, just a couple days ago, I was at an exorcism here in the city of Rome where for over six hours, myself, another per priest who was actually the exorcist, and then a couple of other priests were there as well, praying over this person for like six or seven hours to pray for the freedom of this person, the authentic freedom to be experienced in their life. Apparently they were possessed, if you will. So they were actually going through the rite of exorcism that the church lays out, for those kinds of cases. And there came a moment in the six hours of prayer, nonstop, where they were getting weak, they were getting, uh, you know, attacked themselves, they could feel the presence literally of evil in the room. And one, at one particular moment, this is what 
kind of happened or transpired. They said the person who's being exercised actually began to speak out and to say some words. And apparently, it turns out, he says, our Blessed Mother had commanded this demon to speak out on Pope Benedict XVI. And here's what he said. This is the demon speaking to this person who was ultimately possessed. We tried to stop it. We tried to stop it. We tried to stop it over and over again. And this kind of yelping, this kind of screeching, this kind of horrific voice coming out of this person. And the person went on to explain that it was she, capital S-H-E, she, Our Lady, who enabled all this to happen, who was in fact commanding this demon, all demons are at her feet, as we see in that beautiful depiction of her with the, the snake at her feet. She in fact commanded this demon to speak out these things and to screech these things, that we tried to stop this appointment. We tried to stop this, but we could not. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying what recounted was recounted to me, but it rings of truth. He had no reason to lie, as several other priests told me, and uh, exorcisms are, in fact, happening in the world. The devil does exist. We are in a battle. And I think when you look at, when it comes to naming of a pontiff, I think, the, you know, the very dregs of hell would rise up to try and stop this process from happening in the way that our Lord would want it to happen. So we pray for Pope Benedict the 16th. We pray in a big way. I encourage all of you to try and make a trip out to Rome. It's really, you will be blessed by it. Catholics and non-Catholics alike are blessed by this. Do something to try and make that happen. And uh, uh, it's not that difficult, okay? It will be difficult once you do it, but that's a good sign. That's a confirmation that you are doing the right thing. And you will be, in fact, blessed by it. Amen.